So good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are right now. So I'm so pleased to welcome everyone to this special roundtable to mark the first ever SDG Week Canada. So SDG Week Canada is a chance to showcase and accelerate action on the UN Sustainable Development Goals across college, institute, and university campuses in coordinated and collaborative ways that are so uniquely Canadian. So to begin, I want to recognize uh, that uh, Colleges and Institutes Canada's offices in Ottawa are located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. So from Ottawa, Colleges and Institutes Canada is the national and international voice of Canada's colleges, institutes, CIGEPs, polytechnics, and 15 universities. And in everything we do, we aim to strengthen the system of higher education. Our work, which you will get to hear a bit about later, gives colleges and institutes the opportunity to work together towards a common goal to learn from each other and to maximize the impact of Canada's largest post-secondary network in the spirit of the SDGs. So just a housekeeping note, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A window in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, uh, I'm also very pleased to welcome Minister Kevin Gould, Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, who will lead the discussion on the challenges faced by youth and communities and the opportunities to advance the SDGs and how we can work together to accelerate progress on the 2030 Agenda. So the Honourable Karina Gould was first elected as the Member of Parliament for Burlington in 2015. And she has previously served as Minister of International Development. We used to work with her closely in that role. And also she has been Minister of Democratic Institutions, a graduate of McGill University and the University of Oxford. Uh, Minister Gould is passionate about helping Canadian families, helping the public service, and uh, also helping international development. Before her uh, election as the Member of Parliament for Burlington, Burlington, she worked as a trade and investment specialist for the Mexican Trade Commission in Toronto. She has been a consultant for the Migration and Development Program at the Organizations of American States in Washington, D.C., and she spent a year volunteering in an orphanage in Mexico. Minister Gould has deep roots in her hometown of Burlington, Ontario. She is also an active member of her community and an advocate for families women's issues, and affordable housing. She has volunteered with and actively supports the Iroquia Bruce Trail Club, the Burlington Chapter of the Canadian Federation of University Women, the Mississauga F Furniture Bank, the Halton Women's Place, and many other local organizations. So, Minister, yours now. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Denise, Denise, for that wonderful um, introduction. And thank you to everyone who is joining us today for, I think, what's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, J'aimerais vous donner tous la bienvenue et vous remercier d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with here, here with you today and discuss the opportunities and challenges that you have faced um, in your work to accelerate progress towards the 2030 Agenda. 
to begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining you today from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and I am very thrilled to moderate today's discussion. Um, I won't introduce myself because Denise did a great job of doing that, um, but before I begin introducing our panelists, I would like to take this opportunity to speak about why youth and community involvement and engagement in SDGs is crucial for advancing the 2030 Agenda. The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, represent an incredible opportunity to take action. When thinking about how far reaching and all encompassing the 17 SDGs are, I have to admit it can be a bit overwhelming. There are so many ambitions and targets to advance, sometimes it's hard to know where to start, especially when every SDG is so important. But the good news is that the SDGs are all interconnected and making progress on one SDG also advances others. In other words, every effort counts. But most importantly, progress on the SDGs relies on everyone's contribution. This is one of the foundational concepts of moving forward together, Canada's 2030 Agenda National Strategy, which was launched just over a year ago. In our national strategy, we talk about an enabling environment and whole of society contributions. And what that really means is that there is a call for action for every segment of society to participate. Every single person, organization, group, and company is capable of advancing progress on the 2030 Agenda and its SDGs. As we look into the future, we need to particularly listen and engage with youth and communities to understand where we need to be and how to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Youth and communities are important agents of change and their involvement in Canada's implementation of the 2030 Agenda is pivotal to ensuring that no one is left behind. In the coming months, we will be publishing Canada's second voluntary national review report and taking stock of our whole of society progress on the goals. This is a great way to obtain feedback from youth and community organizations and think about what's working, what needs more attention, and where there are greater opportunities for collaboration. This VNR also represents a promise to Canadians to be accountable for how far we've come with the 2030 Agenda as a collective. Today we will be hearing from panelists who have supported projects and have worked with passionate and inspiring young SDG advocates. I'm really looking forward to hearing their perspectives and understanding what we can all do to encourage and facilitate further participation in the 2030 Agenda, especially from young people because incorporating their voices around the decision-making table isn't just a best practice, it's a necessity. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our panelists. From the Colleges and Institutes of Canada, Judy Bargata, the Manager of Government Relations and Canadian Partnerships, will speak about their project that deepens awareness of an action on the SDGs among colleges, institutes, polytechnics, and CEGEPs across this country. Our second panelist is from the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation, Jordan Smith, who is the program lead that, um, there, and she will discuss how they were able to convene roundtables with multi-stakeholder groups, including youth, to gather feedback on how to best approach the national strategy and effectively engage and connect with Indigenous youth on the SDGs. From Vancouver Island University, uh, Jenica N. Cornish, the Assistant Manager for Projects Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, will speak to how they engaged the different campus and surrounding communities in integrating the SDGs while integrating Indigenous knowledge on sustainability into conversations at the community level. And our final panelist is Selma Luli from the University of Laval, Assistant Vice President, Academic and Student Affairs, Pierre Lemay, Assistant to the Vice Rector for International Affairs and Sustainable Development, and Karen Bouchard, Assistant Director for the Institute for Environment, Development and Society from the Université Laval, will discuss how they were able to mobilize students around the SDGs and also speak to their transformational approach to integrating uh, the SDGs and local communities supporting voluntary local reviews. So without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Judy Vargatoth to kick us off. Judy, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Minister. Merci beaucoup et bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful webinar during the first ever SDG Week Canada. Uh, we're very excited at Colleges and Institutes Canada uh, because our work on the SDGs uh, has gone on to greater and greater depths and heights since our initial um, funding for the project that was um, uh, provided by the SDG unit at ESDC. So our project, as you said, Minister, was to engage Canadian colleges, uh, institutes, polytechnics, and CEGEPs, uh, as well as some universities, including Vancouver Island, one of our members, uh, in collaboration on the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, being Canada's largest post-secondary network of over 140 institutions, Everything that we do is about youth and students and the future uh, workforce of Canada. And nothing could be more important than integrating the sustainable development goals and uh, uh, sharing with youth and students uh, what these SDGs are, what the 2030 agenda is. Um, and as you said, it's a whole of society ap uh, approach. And for sure, the post-secondary sector and our sector in particular uh, really sees um, itself as having a pivotal role in uh, succeeding with the 2030 agenda. Our project was focused on five different uh, areas of activity uh, related to the Sustainable Development Goals begun in 2019 before the pandemic. It feels like a different world uh, for sure. Um, and so our commitment was to bring the SDGs to as many of our campuses as possible and to uh, engage uh, everyone from the senior leadership right through all of the faculty, the staff, uh, the students uh, on champions the Sustainable Development Goals. And we did that uh, through uh, creating SDG roundtables where we went out and met pre-COVID. Pre we managed to have one roundtable in British Columbia uh, in the fall of 2019. And then we pivoted to online virtual uh, presentations to many, many campuses. And we convened a group of our members to be an advisory committee. And through them, we decided that we needed to develop a toolkit for uh, colleges and institutes to integrate the SDGs. Uh, and we've created what we call uh, the SDG Toolkit for Canadian Colleges and Institutes, uh, La Boîte à Outils des ODD pour les Collèges et Instituts Canadiens. And uh, this toolkit uh, has over 40 case studies of the different ways that post-secondaries have integrated the Sustainable Development Goals into their curriculum, into their applied research, into their campus infrastructure planning, into their work with communities, uh, as well as uh, um, bringing it into the campus culture and the awareness of all the people who study or work on campuses. Uh, this toolkit has just been updated in honor of SDG Week Canada. And so we continue to bring it up to date long after the formal project is over. It's become a permanent commitment of CICAN. We also signed the SDG Accord, uh, which is the Global Accord for Post-Secondary Institutions, uh, and it calls upon post-secondaries uh, leadership as well as student unions and individual faculty members and students to sign the SDG Accord as a public commitment to the 2030 Agenda. And not only did uh, our President Denise sign this on behalf of our members, but she called upon all of the members of CICAN to also sign this accord as their commitment. And I'm excited to say that almost one third of our members have signed the SDG Accord, as well as a large number of student unions, as well as individual faculty members and students. And so this is the vehicle by which we are continuing this conversation uh, with our campuses. And when a, uh, an institution signs the accord, they make a commitment to integrate the SDGs into everything that they do. And so we know that these members that have signed it are uh, participating in SDG Week very actively and uh, continuing to work with their students and their faculty to raise awareness of the importance of Canada's role in the world in accomplishing the 2030 Agenda. And I'll just close off uh, by mentioning the involvement of students in our work. So we created 
uh, a new advisory committee for uh, Colleges and Institutes Canada called the Impact Student and Alumni Advisory Committee. And this committee, uh, we invited our members to nominate a student uh, to this committee. And we founded it in 2019. And we've had numerous cohorts of this committee uh, meet to guide CI Can. Uh, and I'm sure that Denise would agree that they have done so exceptionally well. And to your point, Minister, about young people and students really being the future, we really felt that this committee has brought so much to our awareness and uh, really motivated a lot of significant change, both at CICAN as a national association, but also across our membership with their vision, their projects, their uh, recommendations, sometimes with their insistence that we act uh, in accordance with our values. And so it's been my pleasure to work with this committee for a number of years. Uh, and so that kind of rounds out the work that we did over about a year and a half because with the pandemic, we extended the project a little bit. And uh, we've continued to this day to champion the SDGs um, by hosting webinars such as this as well. So that's all I will say. Thank you very much. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Judy, uh, for that overview. And of course, for all the work that CIA uh, CI can, CIC can, um, is doing to promote the SDGs right across the country and on campuses. And, and I can say I was at the University of Regina yesterday um, talking about um, the SDGs, and it was great to be able to engage students um, uh, on it. So thank you to you and your team for all the work that you've been doing. Um, I'd now like to turn to Jordan Smith from the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation to talk a little bit about the work that uh, she's been doing. Koe Karina and Nindalawisi, Jordan, Delaware Blues Cap McMuggy. Hello, my name is Jordan and I am from Blues Cap First Nation in McMuggy, Nova Scotia. Uh, I am calling in from the Gambia, so if anyone could give me a heads up if my audio is cutting in and out, that would be appreciated. For the past two years, I have been working as a program officer with the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation, also known as ACIC. And I'm currently working with the International Internships for Indigenous Youth Program, which supports First Nation, Métis and Inuit interns from across Canada to engage with ACIC's global partners. I have also worked with the Our Communities, Our Voices program, which aims to support Indigenous women, girls and Two-Spirit youth to bring their community voices to the forefront of discussions about SDGs. So while I am very proud of the work that we We've done and I could talk about it all evening. Uh, there are lots of great resources and reports on our website, which you can see at acic-caci.org. But today I would like the opportunity to speak about some of the lessons that I've learned while working with some of these incredible youth leaders and within the Indigenous communities. Um, I'm very grateful to be invited to speak here today on behalf of ACIC and to bring the perspectives of these young Indigenous leaders to this discussion. So while leave no one behind is a priority of the 2030 agenda, Indigenous communities worldwide continue to lack engagement and consultation in global SDG work. As we take stock of our national actions towards the 2030 agenda, there's a clear lack of authentic engagement and representation of Indigenous communities in this work. When you consider that there are Indigenous communities in this country that have not had access to clean drinking water for over 25 years, that Indigenous women and girls are 12 times more likely to be murdered or go missing than any other women in Canada, that the suicide rate of our youth aged 15 to 24 is six times higher than non-Indigenous Canadian youth. Our communities lack food security, access to healthcare and quality education, and they've been systematically separated from their lands, traditions, language, and culture. Indigenous communities have the highest stakes when it comes to addressing the SDGs, and yet they continue to be underrepresented, especially in high level decision making regarding the 2030 agenda. While we take stock of these national actions and identify our next steps in implementing the 2030 agenda, we need to acknowledge this incredible disregard. 
Indigenous communities are not only disproportionately impacted by these issues, but they have a wealth of knowledge and ability to make some really incredible contributions to the global goals. Traditional teachings and ways of living in peace with our lands, our water, our wildlife, which date back thousands of years, are invaluable to the pursuit of the 2030 Agenda. In my community, the Mi'kmaq teaching of Ngoma, or all my relations, reflects how we are all interconnected to the world around us. The lack of Indigenous consultation and leaders in positions of power negatively affects our entire global community. Improving the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between Indigenous communities in Canada is an essential part of achieving the SDGs. And prioritizing leave no one behind means attending to these deep-rooted inequalities that shape the international cooperation sector and influence how development agendas are implemented more deliberate effort into engaging new stakeholders, especially those who are underserved, underrepresented, and under-resourced is so important. And finally, acknowledging that these issues can truly only be addressed through self-determined solutions led by Indigenous communities. Uh, and thank you for hearing me speak. I'm looking forward to sharing some more um, lessons learned during our discussion. Great. Thank you, Jordan. I didn't realize you were joining us from the Gambia. So um, thanks for staying up late there as well. Um, and thank you for your insights. I had the privilege of meeting Jordan last year um, during a similar event. And so it's uh, it's great to see you again and glad uh, to have you. And we'll look forward to those insights later on in the conversation. Um, I'm also now pleased to present um, Jenica Ng Cornish uh, from the University of Victoria to talk about about their SDG project. Jenica. Thank you, Minister Gould, and uh, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Jenica. I am calling in today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Snanimalt First Nation on the east coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Um, and I'll just give a little bit of a kind of brief introduction of where I work and how it kind of ties in to this conversation. So uh, I work for the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, which is um, an entity of Vancouver Island University. So um, we work to support the university's academic and research mandates, as well as um, we are kind of the research and education arm of a UNESCO designated biosphere reserve, which is the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Reserve, uh, located kind of central Vancouver Island. Um, so we have several sort of mandates and visions that we fulfill through our research institute. Um, and I'll start by talking a little bit about how we became involved with working um, with the SDGs in collaboration with Vancouver Island University or VIU. So uh, in 2018, we started uh, by working with the Office of the President in looking at how the university is currently contributing to the SDGs. Um, so this was a lot of data collection interviews, things like that. And the main outcome was a report highlighting um, a baseline for where the university currently stands in terms of how they're contributing to the goals, as well as okay, here's how we can continue taking action and moving forward. Um, so we gathered some recommendations from community engagement events with the VIU community and surrounding communities as well. Um, so that report was produced in 2020, which at this point is already outdated, but again, it kind of serves as a baseline for um, here's what we know is happening and how can we kind of continue to move forward. Um, and in addition to this report, there was a series of engagement, community engagement initiatives that uh, we're focused around raising awareness about the SDGs as well as gaining feedback on the progress that VIU is making towards the SDGs. So we hosted um, events like lunch and learns on campus, a lot of social media promotion, um, presentations to VIU classes, engagement booths around, around the campus and in communities, um, some training sessions and symposiums and such like that. Um, a lot of this engagement was targeted mostly towards the student population at Vancouver Island University. And then, so that kind of led us into um, our project funded by um, the Government of Canada, where 
we really focused more on increasing that engagement and awareness piece of the work that we were doing with the SDGs. So um, we continued a lot of the engagement initiatives that we had started doing, expanding them to be able to engage not only with the VIU community, but also surrounding communities uh, such as youth and in, in the local school districts um, and local organizations that are working in many different ways to contribute to the SDGs. So we were, we were lucky enough to be able to do a lot of in-person engagement um, pre-COVID. So holding events like um, we held a symposium for municipal planners, workshops on how to kind of look at the goals and be able to localize them in a way that's less overwhelming. Um, we did some training sessions for VIU students um, and a lot of, again, a lot of presentations to, to classes at VIU. And then once um, the pandemic hit, we were able to transition some of these things to online formats. So one of our staff, uh, she was trained in hosting a social simulation game where people who signed up were able to come in and it was kind of a, a role-playing sort of situation where you would be sort of a leader of a country and figure out how you need to kind of manage your resources and manage different things um, to kind of have an outcome of overall sustainability and sustainable development, which was a really cool, a really cool game. Um, so yeah, overall, all that work that was done um, was focused on increasing knowledge around, and awareness around the SDGs. Um, another thing that we were able to do was create a series of short videos that mainly focused on um, initiatives that VIU is undertaking that align with the SDGs. Um, so those are available on the VIU website um, if you're able, if you would like to take a look. And one thing that I would like to speak to um, is in terms of integrating Indigenous knowledge. Um, in regards to the SDGs and as a non-Indigenous person, a settler, um, I can't you know, necessarily speak from an Indigenous perspective, but what I will say is that the funding from the SDG program did provide supports for our team to open dialogue and open conversations um, with Indigenous communities um, and Indigenous representatives of the different campuses of VIU. Uh, so we engaged with all the different campuses um, and something I would like to share from one of the elders in residence, Marlene Price, she spoke to, and you can see this in one of the videos that was produced, um, she spoke to the importance of walking together in terms of coming out, this was coming out of the pandemic or kind of just towards the sort of tail end of lockdown. So she was speaking to the importance of walking together in um, being able to contribute to an overall good and better future. Um, and as we all know, a big part of the SDGs is the partnerships portion for sustainable development. And um, I think the way that she spoke about the importance of walking together and sharing worldviews and sharing different types of knowledges and being open to learning about different types of knowledges was a really uh, beautiful way to talk about the importance of partnerships and collaboration, mutual respect in terms of uh, working towards sustainability and sustainable development. And um, the last thing I'll say is that we, Vancouver Island University is pleased to sign the SDG Accord that Judy was talking about earlier um, in 2022. So the university is excited to be part of an international higher education community that's sharing resources and strategies to uh, support the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Jenica, for sharing that. And it's great to hear that uh, University of Vancouver Island has uh, signed on to that accord. So that's excellent. Good work. And it sounds like you were so busy um, <laughs> over the past couple of years doing really important engagement. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd now like to turn to our final a uh, group of panelists, actually, it's not a panelist, it's um, three folks from the Université Laval who are going to share a little bit about the work they were doing to mobilize um, students around the SDGs. So um, it's going to be uh, Selma Lily, Pierre Lemay, and Karen Bouchard. I don't know who is planning on starting or speaking. I'll be starting. I'll be it's starting. over to you guys. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Minister Gould. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Very happy to share with you our expertise and experience uh, with the SDGs at Université Laval. Um, we will be two speakers, which will be me and with Karen Bouchard. And uh, Pierre Lemay will be assisting us, and if needs uh, make interventions, he will do it. So, uh, so uh, I will do two things. First of all, I will just position University Laval as uh, in the time 
uh, Times Higher Education Impact tracking, uh, Ranking. It is considered as the 36th in global position. It is in the first position in Quebec and the eighth position in Canada. Uh, we've been endorsing the sustainable development since 2007, and we moved now from sustainable development to sustainable development goals. And we are working very hard with our, with our students who are on vacation this week, the spring break. So they organized the SDG week between February 6th to February 10th. <laughs> so they left, so they made many, several, several activities and we collaborated with them in these, uh, all these works. And uh, we are focusing a lot, let's say about two things, three things at University Laval. The first one is really to engage our professors, uh, um, uh, our uh, students uh, around the SDGs. So we are working on development of SDGs trainings that will be available to all our students and to all our employees of Université Laval so that they will acquire and um, uh, engage in these uh, um, goals. Also, we are working very hard with our professors to make a mapping of our courses. So we'd like to see in our courses, more than 50,000 courses, so which ones are covering the SDGs and which SDGs. So we're using machine learning techniques and we have really uh, um, a very excellent team led by Pierre Lemay and Daniel Forget who are working with, our, with these guys to really make a cartography of all our courses at University of Havana. We will be very happy to share with you all this expertise also with all the other universities and institutes in Canada. And also we are working with uh, our uh, students in research. In our uh, strategic research plan, it is mandatory, kind of, mandatory that your research is aligned with the SDG. So we are encouraging a lot our researchers to conduct uh, research aligned with the SDGs, uh, and we we um, we organize events so that our researchers explicitly show the links between what they are on their ongoing research and the SDGs. And we are working very closely with the Institute of Environment, Development and Society that uh, I'm sharing right now uh, for the next four months. But I will leave the floor to Karen to present some of the projects that we are conducting in this uh, uh, institute. So Karen, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sal. Uh, first of all, I would like to share that that's a, a real opportunity to share with you uh, today because uh, the purpose of l'Institut EDS is the st sustainable uh, development first. It is existing si since uh, 2005. And little and little, that became also uh, the 17 uh, sustainable um, development goals. So uh, every single day, uh, the end Institutes, uh, the Institute is sharing and uh, organizing activities and projects for the more than 500 members. Two thirds of them are um, the YALT, uh, they are students at the Laval University, but also uh, L'Institut EDS is a scientist, a multidisciplinary scientist Carrefour with our communities. So uh, I would love to share about three. Um, very specific projects today. And one of them for sure is uh, supported by the federal government. And um, it is the Sustainable Development Goals, Transformational and Integrative Demarche in local communities. So what is that, that exactly? Uh, it is supported by uh, Etienne Berthold, uh, a, a scientist uh, researcher and uh, Liliana Diaz. Uh, they are doing an amazing uh, job. Uh, they are working with three communities uh, in uh, the province of Quebec and a First Nation territory to um, bring them to uh, find some solution to activate sustainable uh, development goals and plantation in their uh, daily life, in their action plan annual action plan. So it is a kind of map <laughs> for uh, the other communities. We 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 would love that that will become uh, a reference for uh, the communities through the province of Quebec, as well as from Canada. 
So that uh, that project just started a year before, and it is with La Ville de Bé Saint Paul, Ville de la Malbi, Ville de Québec, and um, La Nation Iran uh, won that, and it is going uh, very fast, very well, and that. That project is, is so energetical that uh, we're born two other projects. Uh, what is uh, the creation of a working group on an SDG open data community for Quebecois cities and town. So um, led by the uh, EDS Institute in collaboration with the, Minister, the Ministère des Affaires municipales et de l'habitation, uh, the Bureau Coordinateur de Développement Durable, and a plethora of scientific researchers uh, amongst which are Etienne Bertold, just Rajasund, Stefan Roch, Stefan Roche, pardon. And uh, this data community will rely on all potential and interested stakeholders' collaboration and information sharing capacities. Um, so that is the first project. And the second one is a, a, very, a network, uh, a new net network project uh, just to link all together uh, the francophone academic and non academic um, representative uh, to uh, identify the needs and find solution uh, supported by um, the, the, the researchers. So um, it is uh, very important to, um, to, to, to go through that, that central projects to understand that there is some other project very important for, uh, for us uh, related to uh, the sustainable development and uh, SDGs uh, globally. And um, we'll share about that a little later on, but um, it is a challenge just to be sure that we can go further with all the support uh, with um, the funds to uh, go uh, through that uh, challenges. Excellent. Merci, uh, Karen et, et Selj. I really appreciate your contributions today. Thanks to all of our panelists for, I think, kicking us off in a, in a good way. So I'm now going to um, start the Q&A session, um, and I have a few questions for our panelists. So the first one is uh, for everyone. Um, so there's two questions here. Were your projects impacted by the pandemic and how? And you all touched on this a little bit. And what strategies did you put in place to be able to move forward in this context? Um, is there anyone, Judy, looks like you want to start. Sure, I can start. Yeah, so of course, absolutely, it did affect us. I'll have to say that at first we thought it would be uh, a very big problem, but I've uh, never seen a group of people pivot so successfully uh, to deal with the pandemic. So, you know, the project was not even halfway through, about a quarter of the way through. And we did the usual things that everybody did, I'm sure, pivot to online meetings and so on. But I think even more excitingly, I think that it, um, it actually increased the engagement of uh of our of our various um uh stakeholders partners and so on uh they uh felt that the with the online format the the frequency of meetings was higher like the student committee that i mentioned you know we had you know, we weren't sure how frequently they would be comfortable meeting. We had originally thought maybe quarterly meetings like boards of adults usually meet like quarterly. And no, they wanted to meet every month. And when COVID hit, they actually came to us and said, now we want to meet every week. And so the students uh, met with us, uh, supporting them every single week for the first four to six months of the pandemic. Uh, and so it was a really incredible opportunity to, ex to, to get to know them better and to explore further what, they're, uh, what they were seeing and what they wanted to see in this world. And as you'll remember, uh, the concept of Build Back Better really took on a lot of uh, energy. And so our student group uh, really took that to heart uh, and really uh, came back to see I can with a lot of very uh, hard hitting points about what Build Back Better might look like. And another thing that we did that was really great to uh, address the, the pandemic is that we started like a, a live TV show that allowed uh, members to connect with us uh, on a monthly basis. And we, and we called it Perspectives Live. And this allowed us to engage uh, bringing members and guest speakers to talk around the table uh, about 
ch the challenges that were being faced by the world around the pandemic. And so I would say that, uh, you know, of course, there were a lot of challenges, but the the result was, I think, a tighter knit community than what we had even envisaged beforehand. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Judy. It sounds like you were able to pivot. And it also sounds like you played a really important role um, engaging students um, at a time, at a scary time, um, at a time of uncertainty that gave them some comfort and I think a purpose, right? So I, I think that's that's wonderful. Is there anyone else who would like to jump in here? So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to to add that during the pandemic, which is fantastic, we we uh, we put in place at University Laval an international network for climate change. And we did that during the pandemic. It is called the UNIC network. And you are all welcome to join this great network. We have more than 900 students across the world who joined us. And we did our first, I think, meeting. It was a virtual meeting about the climate change, several universities and partners around the world. And the university put this in place. He's leading this, uh, you, this network and put that in place during the pandemic. And we got a great engagement, either from our students or from the international students or from our students in other universities in Canada. So yes, the pandemic uh, has some bad impacts, but also allowed us to move on forward in some extra interesting initiatives and open the floor, the door. And Pierre Demay, who is with us at University Laval, and me, you can, Karen, you can, you can contact us. And if you'd like to connect, we'll be very happy to share with you all information about that. So this is our contribution during the pandemic and engaging our students, our youth, in that. Yeah, that that's fantastic. Um, I mean, I think I think that's something that we um, that we all experienced, right? And Judy talked about it at the beginning that, you know, when the pandemic first hit, it was like, what are we going to do? And then all of a sudden, um, I mean, obviously it was hard and it was difficult. It was not a good time, but it also made us pivot really quickly to new ways of connecting and connecting with folks that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So um, thank you for sharing that initiative. And I mean, 900 students from around the world is um, is quite an accomplishment. So congratulations on that. Um, Jordan, I see you've come off mute. Yeah, I'd like to just reflect what Sal mentioned, which is that there are pros and cons. My mom always taught me to say the bad news first so that you could be brought back up by the good news after. Uh, so definitely we know that marginalized communities were more harshly impacted by COVID and that would stand for the Indigenous communities that I worked with. Face-to-face uh, -face interaction and coming together in person is very important, especially when you're trying to build relationships with communities. Um, however, when we did pivot some of our programs, especially uh, our international internship program to virtual, we suddenly were able to connect with a group that we hadn't been able to connect with before, such as young parents, uh, students in school, folks that aren't able to travel internationally were suddenly able to connect with international communities and be part of the program. So that was actually a really positive thing that we may have never discovered had COVID not forced us to go down that route. Oh, that's really interesting, um, Jordan. And I think, you know, it's um, it's interesting to think about who was facing barriers before virtual options were available and how some of these new ways of connecting have enabled people uh, to participate in ways that just weren't available to them before. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jenica, is there anything you wanna add on this topic? Sure, yeah, um, I will say that, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, in terms of engaging with Indigenous communities specifically, um, in-person engagement is really, really important, as, as Jordan mentioned. Um, and of course, with the pandemic, that's not something we were able to do, and also not a priority for a lot of the communities to have um, university staff um, approach them to talk about things like the SDGs. Um, there's a lot of other concerns and issues that local First Nations deal with, even without the pandemic, they're stretched very thin. So. Um, you know, we had to be mindful of 
what's appropriate to try and approach about, what's appropriate to try and talk about here. Um, and so some of those things we just had to say, okay, you know, we kind of have to just wait this out and um, allow there to be time. And that's a, that's a really tough thing, especially with funding programs and working, you know, we work in an academic setting at Vancouver Valley University, of course. And um, so timelines are often very rushed and rigid, but having kind of opening the mindset to being able to sort of make those timelines more fluid and flexible, um, I think was a really important learning opportunity for a lot of us. Um, because in the end, it's the relationship building is the really important piece and being able to have the conversations are what is really important. Um, but something that is, I mean, a little more uh, positive, I guess, is that um, being on a university campus and being primarily surrounded by students and youth while well, during the pandemic the campus was of course very quiet um we did have kind of the benefit of these younger people being very engaged online already um and some of them of course were starting to experience zoom fatigue and things like that with all their classes transitioning but um i think we did find an opportunity to sort of help to um i guess make things a little more fun for some people in terms of how things were done online. So breaking up some classes where lectures were done online, we were still able to do some virtual presentations and um, engaging, I think, presentations somewhat interactive and the, um, the social simulation game that I mentioned was a really fun way just to still engage with people in a safe manner where everybody is working from home. Um, and yeah, just, just doing a lot of engagement and kind of outreach over social media, which is, um, obviously very common nowadays. Yeah, that's really interesting. I kind of think everyone should participate in this, um, this uh, social um, game that you were talking about and having to reflect on the difficult trade-offs <laughs> that are always, that always come with decisions, particularly when you're governing um, a country. Uh, so I think that's, that sounds really interesting. I might like to play it um, sometime. Um, one of the things that I've been reflecting on through this conversation is, um, you know, during the height of the pandemic and the beginning of the pandemic, I was the Minister of International Development and uh, so responsible for Canada's work on SDGs internationally. And now I find myself in the fortunate position to be responsible for Canada's domestic work on the SDGs. But one of the things that, um, you know, we reflected a lot on um, during the pandemic is that the SDGs were the right roadmap to bring us out of the pandemic anyways, right? Like that they, they really were the right roadmap before the pandemic and post pandemic and they continue to be because they they provide this you know overarching um set of objectives that really tries to build a more sustainable future in kind of all aspects of of our lives um and so it's interesting to hear all of you reflect on how, um, you know, having conversations about the SDGs at a very difficult time um, was actually something that provided an opportunity to, you know, really think hard about the country and the world that we want to live in um, and what that future looks like and, and what it looks like um, for, for youth and for students and for marginalized communities. And so, um, you know, I really do want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on, on that work that you did. Um, and I think the importance of, you know, providing a space virtually in many instances um, for folks to, to gather and to have these conversations and to really think about these, these issues. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. So I want to get to a couple more questions. So um, the next one, I'm hoping the Université Laval could provide their perspective on. So in terms of youth engagement, what have been the main lessons learned when it comes to engaging with youth? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Gould. Thank you for this question. This is very, very interesting. So as I mentioned, we, we put in place the UNIC uh, network, but also we do two things with our students, which is very amazing also, that I would like to share with you, is that um, in the last um, three years, we put in place two specific programs, uh, what we call in French, les chantiers d'avenir. Mm -hmm. So these are the uh, uh, two specific programs. One is on food security, which is very important, where we have students uh, around the world uh, following uh, multidisciplinary courses mm -hmm. 
And uh, we have many several partners in these uh, programs where students make internships in, on the ground. So we have people in the north of Canada, we have people in South America, we have people in the sub-Saharan Africa, so working on food uh, safety and security. And this is very interesting. And the new one that we are putting in place starting in next September, and we work with these programs with our students. So, so which is very interesting is these programs are co-created with the students. They are not only professors in their offices. These are their students around the table discussing this. And the second one is about climate change, which is called the Chantier d'Avenir en Action Climatique. And uh, this is very interesting because we have more than uh, six different disciplines from different faculties, from medicine, from pharmacy, from business, from engineering, all these people are around for the students. And we have also, we are working and building these great partnerships where students will make their internships in uh, different places around the world to study climate change. So from the perspective of University Laval, as mentioned with the different projects to make the uh, cartography of uh, sustainable development goals in our courses, but also we co-create a new uh, programs. Uh, and these are great programs in the master uh, level with our students, with our partners around these two main issues of sustainable development goals. Well, the first one is food security and the second one is the climate change. And these getting more and more success. And just to give a short example, in the first year when we launched the program for the food security, only uh, 12 or 13 students followed this program. Now, today, as of today, 60 applications for the program, six zero, which is amazing in two years. And for the climate change, uh, we are expecting around 30 students. And up to now, we received around 15, if I'm right. We opened the registration for this program just two weeks ago. And we are almost for 15 applications in this program. So this is very interesting to see the engagement of our students, our communities around these two great topics. This is what I wanted to share with you about this point, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. That's very interesting. And I think the co-creation aspect is one that's very empowering um, and I'm sure very engaging. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jordan, I wanted to turn to you on the challenges and opportunities and importance um, that you see in integrating Indigenous culture and knowledge in the SDGs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my important lessons comes from a quote from an art, uh, author, Casey Davis, and sort of reflects on what Jenica mentioned earlier. And that quote is, you can't save the world when you're drowning. And a lot of our Indigenous communities are drowning. And that's a big challenge when we are coming into the those communities and asking for them to engage instead of us coming out and asking how can we help and support. Um, so that's definitely a challenge when it comes to uh, working with Indigenous communities and the SDG. Uh, the other one, especially where we have so many scholarly speakers today, is reimagining what quality education looks like and reimagining uh, what we acknowledge as a quality education. Um, often we don't recognize, you know, our traditional knowledge or our elders as um, being scholars because they haven't attended a university, but there's actually so much knowledge and strength within these communities. Um, and it was something that a lot of our Indigenous youth spoke to, um, was reimagining what a quality education could look like. Um, again, I know that's, that's quite brief and we have a short amount of time here, um, but please feel free to visit the ACIC website again, as there's lots of great resources available on there around what uh, quality education could look like. So. Thanks, Jordan. No, I think that's really interesting. And I've, I've always found uh, your perspective and experience on this really interesting. And so I do hope people go and uh, visit the report and get a read on it, because I think it is really important that we are thinking about how Indigenous knowledge and culture are integrated into the SDGs here in Canada, but also around the world. Um, next, I wanted to turn to Jenica. Um, from your work, what do you see as some of the big biggest challenges in implementing the SDGs? Yeah, I think, um, and 
I imagine that most people, organizations, communities feel this way is that the SDGs are very overwhelming when you first look at them. There's 17 goals, all these targets and indicators, a lot of very technical language in them as well, especially when you start looking down at the indicators. And so if you're, you know, a small local community figuring out, okay, like how do I implement these goals in my community is a really huge overwhelming task. Um, so I think that that is one of the biggest challenges is figuring out how to make the goals, these global goals relevant and relevant to small places, small communities and individuals as well. Um, you know, we all talk about doing our part individually, but when it comes to these big goals, it, it can feel like almost not enough just doing your own part. So I think that a big challenge is localizing um, and making things relevant. And there's ways that I think our um, project has helped people do that. We've run some workshops on trying to help localize some of the goals, looking at the targets and indicators and um, kind of teaching people that it's okay to omit some indicators that are not relevant to you, because of course they're not all going to be relevant. Um, and maybe you need to modify the measurements of those, or maybe um, there's different things that you need to look at that kind of contributes to an overarching goal in some other way. Um, and I think really the, the main thing to be remembering through all of this is that you're contributing to a bigger picture here in some way, um, really no matter what the means of measurement is necessarily that you're you're doing something that's good and you're doing something that um, has a lot of impact for change and collectively those are the things that um, are what we're looking for and contributing to the 2030 agenda all of these small collective um, actions and impacts. No, oh, that's great. I mean, I think um, that's a really good point about like maybe not in every indicator has to be part of, you know, your life or your organization's um, SDG work, but there are going to be some that are really relevant for the work that you're doing and focus in on those. And when, as you're talking, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, it, it is the collective, it's the sum of all of these parts, right? In that, you know, we've got lots of different organizations working on different aspects of the SDGs, and then how do we bring them together collectively? And that's kind of what we're hoping to do with the Voluntary National Review um, that Canada is presenting this year. It's to provide a, a, a holistic picture of what different levels of government, different organizations, um, different groups of individuals are, are working on um, here in Canada to advance the 2030 agenda. So thanks for that, Jenica. Okay, and just mindful of time, I'm, I'm going to get in one last question, um, and this one is going to go to Judy. Um, what can the government do to better support greater engagement in implementing the SDGs? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think more of what you've already done is great. I think that we have uh, these kinds of events are excellent. And I know the SDG unit had done a whole series of great uh, uh, webinars over the last couple of years that were very interesting uh, because every time I go there, I hear different speakers and I've already taken note of many of your names to follow up with you about the great work you're doing. So I think that uh, bringing Canadians together uh, is really important. Uh, and of course, providing the, the funds, the resources to do the work. Uh, I think that you probably have found and your um, department has found that even smaller amounts of money made a huge difference to what we could do. Um, I would say that that maybe more even more explicitly focusing on marginalized uh, communities that uh, I would include youth into that uh, mix in general, uh, because they really um, have, have suffered through COVID ex exponentially more than the rest of us. So their mental health has really been challenged. Uh, uh, and their faith, really, their faith in adults, in humanity uh, has really been uh, challenged. So I think that uh, um, that focusing more on uh, how we bring uh, communities that haven't been in the mainstream of things like the SDGs, youth, uh, Indigenous communities, um, newcomers to Canada, uh, many of whom, uh, you know, could benefit from knowing and being integrated into this work, um, I think would be really wonderful. Uh, so I think those are the those are the key ways that a, a government can help uh, to bring us all on the same page and then keep providing the inspiration and the opportunity to be involved in things like the high-level political forum, uh, to be involved in the Voluntary National Review, the survey,
surveys and so on. Those are all great ways. Uh, but to the point made by Jenica, I think being aware of the capacity of smaller organizations and smaller communities to engage is very challenging. And I think that uh, obviously uh, reaching out to them is important, uh, but also supporting associations like many of ours that do reach out to those smaller uh, communities uh, and smaller post-secondaries and uh, Indigenous communities like ACIC does, uh, I think is also really important. Great. Thank you, Judy. And I see, Karen, you have your hand up. So a very brief comment, please. Yes, uh, related to that very important question, how can we work together to achieve uh, the SDG goals um, at uh, Laval University and uh, L'Institut de has just started to work on that very important project, uh, Structure Collaborative uh, pour atteindre les ODD. Uh, what is the kind of uh, as a global uh, as, um, SDSN and Canada SDSN, but francophone. So we will love uh, to be uh, to, to work with the, the federal government just to uh, go further because we had conversation for the last year with the 17 uh, other universities, a lot of conversations, as well as with the non-academic world, uh, the Société Civile. So we believe that that can be a very interesting tool uh, to achieve uh, the SDGs. Excellent. It sounds like it. Um, so I uh, just want to conclude, um, first of all, by thanking um, all of our panelists for taking the time to share your experience and to um, give us some insight into the work that you've been doing over the past couple of years in very different circumstances than you anticipated when you took on these projects. Um, but clearly, uh, each of you were able to pivot and adapt um, and really it sounds like to thrive um, despite those challenging circumstances and the changes. Um, so a big congratulations uh, to all of you on that important engagement that you've undertaken taken. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, we are uh, going to be participating in our second national voluntary review on um, the SDGs uh, in July of this year at the High Level Political Forum um, in New York. And uh, we are trying to engage the public on this. And we want to hear um, from Canadians right across this country as to what you're doing as individuals, what your organizations are doing. The portal is open until March 10th. Um, I'm hoping someone will put the website in the chat. Um, and we'll be able to um, to go from there. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been such a great opportunity to engage with everyone today um, and to really make sure that, you know, we keep the SDGs front and center, but we also apply them um, in a way that's relevant uh, for Canada and for Canadians. Like Canada is a, a vast and complex country. And so the 17 SDGs, um, I think, are very relevant um, as we look forward to the future. So a big thank you to everyone who participated. I really appreciate your time. Um, and thanks to everyone who contributed to the organization and um, happy SDG week. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Say good care. <laughs>